Hey guys, this is your master teacher Nobomita Bhattacharjee, and today we are going to start with the chapter chemical bonding, and we're going to end it as well. Now I have finished this uh, session about in uh, two and a little more than two hours, and the chapter is very long. So please do watch the whole session because this chapter is also very important for your upcoming inorganic uh, sessions like uh, P block, DNF block, S block, and coordination compounds and all of these. So. Um, do watch it and i have solved very few problems in the class but i am going to have a separate problem solution class okay so let's go to the board all right all right so we are starting chemical bonding and in this chapter the topics that we are going to take a look at as you can see is obviously cossel lewis approach to chemical bonding yes that's where we will start with and then we will go to octet rule covalent bond lewis representation of Simple molecules, formal charge, limitation of the octet rule, ionic or electrovalent bond, lattice enthalpy, the bond parameters. So till here, it is not very important for J means, right? But then again, we cannot let it go off because these are the basics of this chapter. So if you don't learn this, we will not be able to understand a lot of other uh, chapters in inorganic uh, chemistry like P block, the coordination compound, S block, DNF block, and uh, and uh, we cannot afford to do that because inorganic chemistry holds 30% of our J paper. We cannot do that, right? So we will have to read about this. And then from VSEPR theory, VBT, hybridization, MOT, bonding in some homonuclear diatomic molecules and hydrogen bonding. These are the main important part for your J mains and J advanced. So let's take a look at it without much further ado, okay? Now the story of uh, chemistry, right? Where does it start from? It starts from atoms, obviously, correct? And about that, we have learned about, uh, learned it in structure of atom and we know that how atom look like, right? How, how does an atom look like? Basically, if I have to draw it, this will be an atom. Inside this, right here will be our nucleus where we have the protons and the neutrons. And these will be the shells where our electrons are roaming around, correct? Yeah, this is basically what we learned, correct? Now, we also got to know, my dear students, that the atoms right the atoms they don't like staying alone just like us of course some of us like me i don't like being with anyone i really like staying alone i think i enjoy my company the most in short i'm a loner anyway but there are people we we like having someone around we like having friends we like having our families together isn't it we don't like that and very similarly, the atoms were also found to exist together as one species and they have their characteristic properties. And such a group of atoms, we started calling it molecule, right? Great, okay. Molecule, we understood that atoms, stay, they stick together, we call it molecule. Amazing. Now, you know when a molecule exists, let's talk about the family. So, you know when you are, you have a friend, right? You connect with your friend. There is a bond, right? It, it could be because you share notes, that could be your bond, or it could be an emotional one, right? But in a family also, you have a family bond, you have an emotional bond between you all, which holds the family together, or which holds that friendship bond together, isn't it? Very similarly, when these atoms, they stick together, they form a molecule. Do you know what holds the molecules together? Nothing else but a chemical bond, yes. So how do we define a chemical bond? The definition would be the attractive force. There is an attraction, right? Even in your family, you have an attraction with your mother or your father or your sibling. That is why you are staying together. There is an attractive force. Of course, you fight sometimes. But even then, it is an attraction, attractive force that bonds you all together. And very similarly, the attractive force which holds various constituents, atoms, ions together right in different chemical species is called a chemical bond now let's take a look at it this is my dear student let's say uh, not let's say this is the you know the molecule of h2o right this is the molecule of h2o so this white ones are your hydrogen the red, red one this is your oxygen okay and let's take a look at the chemical bond as you can see look at how these two hydrogen bonds they are coming together they're sharing one one electron each and they are forming a covalent bond. Now, what is a covalent bond? We will read about this in some time, in some time, okay? All right. 
So this is easy peasy biryani tasty, right? No doubts here, I hope. Even if you have, do write it in the comment section. I'll definitely answer, okay? Now moving on, causal Lewis approach to chemical bonding. What did these guys say? And why is it so important? So Cossel and Lewis, their approach to chemical bonding actually came up during uh, Bohr. Yes. So when Bohr had given his atomic theory, they took some inspiration from there and th that's when they came up with their approach to chemical bonding. So now Cossel says that, uh, you know, let's not make our uh, life too tough. And he says that, so you understand how the atom is, right? He, he said something like this. Take a look at it. He said that imagine that this is the nucleus. This is the nucleus, this blue pen is your protons, let's say, protons and neutrons are inside and uh, these are the electrons that are revolving and here is the outermost shell. This white part is the outermost shell where your electrons are roaming. So let's consider this part, the nucleus and the inner electrons to be something called as kernel. What did he say? He said that let's call them something as kernel, K-E-R-N-E-L, as you can see right here, okay. He started calling them kernel. Great. And he said that, see, any which way in a chemical reaction, who takes part? It's always the valence electron, the last shell electrons, they take part. Unless it's a transition element, you know, uh, when, when the inner electrons and the outermost electrons, they are almost of same, same energy and that's when they want to take part. But most of the cases, it is the outermost electrons, they take part. So why complicate life? Why do we have to even study about the inner electrons? Let's only study the outer electrons. Let's call it to be kernel. Great. Now, Lewis said that, let me make it even more easier for you. Okay. Let me make it even more easier for you. Do I have a cube here? I see that I don't have, I do have a cube, but it's a huge cube that I will not be. Okay, I found a laptop here, okay. I found a laptop here. So, let's consider this to be a Lewis. Oh, so, Cossel, huh. Cossel said that, let's call it kernel. Now, Lewis said that, imagine this atom to be a cube. Cube, you know what is a cube, right? Cube has what? It's like a rectangle, but in 3D. So he said that at the central position, you have the kernel. And he said that all the corners, like you have one and two corners here, then three and four corners here, five, six corner, seven, eight. All the eight corners are where you have the eight electrons. Okay. That's exactly what he made. See, at the center right here, you have the kernel and these are the electrons that are holding this position. Okay. Now, further he said that he postulated that atoms, they achieve the stable octet when they are linked by chemical bonds. Okay. Yes. So, he said that it's the octet when they are, they are absolutely stable and they love it. All right. That's what he said. Great. Makes sense, right? Makes sense, everybody. Amazing. Okay. All right. Hmm. Now, now what happened? So, it's because of the octet. Let me just explain it a little bit. So, you know that the noble gases in the periodic table, right? That helium, neon, argon, xenon, redon, krypton and all of that. They have eight electrons in the outermost shell, right? And because they have outermost, uh, they have eight electrons in the outermost shell, they're very stable. They don't want to mingle with someone. They're like, oh, yo, peasants, I don't want to meet with you. Yeah, yeah, go away. No mingling, right? They do that. So now, uh, Lewis and Cossel said that basically what happened was all the other elements, they only want to attain that octet. They only want to attain that eight electrons in the last shell so that they can be stable. That's what he said. And because they want to attain that stability, they want to have that eight electrons, all the bondings happen. Now, some of them, for example, NaCl, in case of sodium chloride, what happens is, from Na, right, check it out here, if this is Na and this is your Cl, so what happens is from Na, actually a transfer of electron happens. An electron actually gets transferred here and that is why it forms something called as ionic bond, okay. Now, there is also a possibility where, for example, uh, you know, hydrogen and hydrogen. So, hydrogen and hydrogen, what they do is, 
hydrogen provides one electron here one electron here and this hydrogen will also provide one electron together they will form together they will form a duplet okay so hydrogen only has the uh, hydrogen has an exception helium also has an exception because helium does not uh, complete its octet it doesn't have eight electrons it has two that's called as duplet so either duplet or octet that's only thing they want to attain right so hydrogen wants to attain the duplet it shares the electron and it forms a covalent bond okay it forms a covalent bond so basically if i have to tell you ionic bond is transfer of electron covalent bond is sharing okay this is sharing right this is sharing and this is a full on transfer that happens here like one electron is given away right okay all right get it okay so that's how the bond is forming and because they have both attained their octet or the duplet they are stable correct that's what lewis said okay easy peasy now lewis said that because we are only talking about the outermost electron outermost electron outermost electron that means we can also have a symbol with the outermost electron yes we are not complicating things we are making things easier right so lewis came up with symbol where he could only where he used to only put a dot and tell you that these many electrons are present in the outermost shell you take a look at it take a look at it here see there is hydrogen here and one dot lithium one dot sodium one dot potassium one dot now what does it mean it means that all of them have one electron in their last shell now take a look at beryllium magnesium calcium all of them have two two electrons that means two electrons in their last shell boron and aluminium three electrons in the last shell carbon and silicon four electrons in the last shell. so you you get my point right now take a look at the helium neon and argon okay if you count 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 there are eight electrons that means stable octet they already have it so what lewis did was in the formation of a molecule he said that only outer shell electrons take part and they are called as valence electrons yes what are valence electrons these are the valence electrons whatever is there in the last shell the inner shell electrons are well protected so they are generally not involved in the combination plot a uh, combination process at all so he introduced this simple notation which we like to call it as lewis symbol today okay so the number of dots that you see here around the symbol it represents the number of valence electrons now do you think that here it is a 5 <laughs> what is the valency valence electrons is 5 yes what is the valency the valency here would be my dear student what you have to do is what you have to do is 8 minus 5 so that means it is 3 1 2 3 4 5 right valency is 3 valence electron is 5 get my point yes get my point now do you notice that lewis was only talking about electron 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 so that means that of course we can call this whole thing as electronic theory of chemical bonding correct so he is also called it as electronic theory of chemical bonding electronic theory of chemical bonding okay that's what he spoke about that's what i mean people also started calling this as electronic theory of chemical bonding understood yes got it great now what is octet rule to attain this octet rule to attain that eight number of electron octet rule is basically nothing but attaining eight electrons in the last shell right how can they attain this la la eight electrons in the last shell either they will do transferring like how you see in case of nacl see transfer of electron is happening there and that's how they are forming bond so transfer of valence electron from one atom to another what do we call it we call this to be ionic bond am i right yes or there is sharing of valence electron like you see in case of hydrogen which is called as your covalent bond okay this is your covalent bond now let me let me explain this with another example here okay i think this will be making more sense to you take a look at this here see how this dog had one bone yes 
this dog the yellow dog had one bone it came and it gave this gave the bone to this white dog and now the white dog has two bo two bones but this one doesn't have any bone so that's your ionic bond full on transfer happened it came and gave the bone away to the white dog right that's your ionic bond nacl now look at here look here yes both of them are two yellow dogs both of them had one one bone this one came and gave this and now both of them are holding on to the bone see both of them are holding on to the bone yes and that is your covalent bond make sense make sense nonsense everybody yes nacl is ionic bond cl cl2 is your covalent bond correct we get it we get it okay all right then now moving on from here let's understand how to make the lewis dot structure okay so there are five points there are five points to make the lewis dot structure very easy you count the total number of valence electrons you identify the central atom you draw the skeleton and join them by single bond you assign remaining number of electron as lone pairs and you convert lone pairs into double or triple bond to complete octet of all atom understood should i move ahead <laughs> of course not right so let me explain this let's take the example of carbon dioxide okay very easy very simple co2 see count the total number of valence electron now carbon has four electrons in the outermost shell so let's write four here plus oxygen has six electrons in the last shell so 2 into 6 is 12 12 13 14 15 16 16 electrons are there identify the central atom i can clearly see that there is only one carbon and there are two oxygens so what i'm going to do is this is my central atom i have drawn the skeleton and i have joined them by single single bond right i've done this okay now what is the remaining see here carbon would have given one electron right take a look at it see carbon is giving one electron here carbon is giving one electron here now oxygen is going to give you one electron here oxygen is again going to give you here one electron so that means total four electrons we have used up right four electrons we have used up so 16 minus 4 is equal to 12 12 electrons are remaining so how am i going to give this 12 electrons see 1 2 3 4 5 6 1 2 3 4 5 6 now the rule says that convert the lone pairs what is this lone pair baba lone pair is basically two electrons two electrons possessed by an atom not involved in a bond okay not involved in a bond so these are called as lone pairs so oxygen has three lone pairs here oxygen has three lone pairs here now what we will do is we will convert this lone pair into a double bond so here this bond will come as a double bond and this bond will come as a double bond that means my final structure my final lewis dot structure will be c double bond o c double bond o and the remaining 1 2 3 4 1 2 3 4 electrons i have drawn and this is my dear student this is my final lewis dot structure okay all right now we come to a term called formal charge what is this formal charge bachcha you have to understand that actually you know there are different lewis structure that is possible for example if i take the uh, if i take the example of ozone right ozone can exist like what is it ozone is o3 so don't you think it can exist like this okay it can exist like this here okay all right yes this three there can be a double bond here or there can be a double bond here and a single bond here both of them are possible right both of them are possible correct so these are called as canonical forms these are called as your canonical forms but in reality it is seen that actually none of them exist the canonical forms don't exist actually what exists is there is something like this so basically it's not two double bonds it's not two double bond but it is rather one and half one and half so the bond length we will study what is bond length but you get it right the length of the bond the bond length is between a single bond and a double bond 
the bond length is not the correct measure measurement of a single bond neither it is a correct measurement of double bond so it's between them so now when you have these three structures how will you choose which one is the actual structure which one is the actual lewis structure problem right so to steer away from this problem okay steer away from this problem what we do is we introduce something called as formal charge basically whichever structure has the least formal charge that will be your actual lewis dot structure okay so let's again take the example of co2 let's take the example of co2 for co2 the structure was c double bond o here c double bond o here 1 2 and 3 4 1 2 3 4 four electrons that are remaining with oxygen that is two lone pair so what is the definition the definition says difference between the number of valence electrons of that atom in an isolated or free state and the number of electrons assigned to that atom in the lewis structure too much understand this see here i have made it easier formal charge is equal to number of valence electrons in the free or neutral state how many number of uh, electrons does uh, carbon have four minus number of lone pairs does carbon have any lone pair zero no lone pair and then half of electrons involved in bonds see 1 2 3 4 2 from oxygen 2 from carbon so for this side 2 from carbon 2 from oxygen for this side that means eight electrons are eight electrons are participating in this bond formation so that means 2 into 4 is 8 so 4 minus 4 is equal to 0 formal charge is 0 hence this lewis structure makes sense to us okay so generally the lowest energy structure is the one with the smallest formal charge and that is your lewis structure got it clear hai yes no doubts here crystal clear easy peasy biryani taste hai? amazing let's move on okay let's move on so <coughs> actually what happened is the octet rule no it dictates the atom are more stable when their valence shells are filled with eight electrons we have understood this right and this 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 rule is based on the chemical inertness of the noble gases right we saw that the noble gases are inert the noble gases don't like to mingle with someone else because they have eight electrons so based on that we gave this rule right but there was limitation obviously there was limitation what was the limitation the incomplete octet of the central atom take a look at it see lical L I C N. Now L I has only one electron in its outermost shell, right? L I has only one electron in its outermost shell, but C L is in the seventeenth group, so there are seven electrons in the outermost shell. So see, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, right? So this electron, when it gets transferred here, the L I C L bond is formed. But the, do you see that is L I able to complete its octet? is li able to complete it so cl is able to cl gets eight electrons definitely but what about li no incomplete octet incomplete octet octet is not complete here now take a look at beh2 right see be beryllium has how many two electrons right beryllium has two electrons so one here hydrogen one here hydrogen 1 2 3 4 only four electrons are there in the valence shell incomplete octet incomplete octet happened so what now what now yes so that was a limitation next what came up was odd electron molecules check out nitrogen yes no and no2 both are examples actually but let me show you no okay so nitrogen has how many nitrogen has basically five electrons right so that means that 1 2 3 4 and 5 okay this electron will be used up oxygen has 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 right so here they have formed the bond now see oxygen 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 7 electron it is forming 7 electron it has no octet here 7 electron and here see 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 6 6 electron they are getting how is it possible See, oh, that's not possible. Same like this for NO two also. The third one, the expanded octet. Now, what happened? More than eight electrons came into the picture. This only happened when there are elements which have three d orbitals. Okay, where there are three d orbitals that are participating. Check out. Example is PF five. Example is 
P F five. Okay. So P P is also in the in in the F. Yeah, I mean N N one. So five electrons, right? So see here one two three four five. Okay. Now check here one two three four five six seven eight. Okay. Fluorine has its eight electron definitely, but look at P. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten electron. P has phosphorus has ten electrons. Expanded octet rule. You get my point. So these are the limitations of this octet rule. These are the limitation of the Coase-Lewis approach to chemical bonding, and that's why we needed something else. Okay. What did we need? We need VSEPR theory, which we for uh, to which we will come later. But now let's understand the ionic or the electrovalent bond. My dear student, we understand that uh, the ionic bond happens when there is a transfer of charge. That means if there is Na and if there is Cl, from Na one electron is coming out of the atom and getting inside the chlorine, right? Right? Yes. In this case, there are three terms also that are used. Okay, three terms. Three terms are ionization and enthalpy. Electron gain enthalpy and lattice enthalpy. So, what is ionization enthalpy? Ionization enthalpy is the energy, the energy required, required to take one electron away from an isolated gaseous atom from an isolated gaseous atom is called your ionization enthalpy basically if i have m that is in gaseous state if this is my atom what i want to do is make it m plus and i have taken one electron away so this is my ionization enthalpy all right get it now what is this electron gain enthalpy? What happened to chlorine? Chlorine accepted one electron, right? Yes. So when the atom is accepting an electron, it will release energy. See, understand it this way. Ionization enthalpy, I always give this example, right? So as a girl, I am shopaholic, right? I love shopping, obviously. I love it, right? I, can't, I cannot stop. I cannot stop, really. I mean, if you see me coming to office, you will almost find me in new clothes every day because that's the amount I love shopping. But shh, you don't tell this to anyone, okay? Anyway, <laughs> so basically what happened is, so I have definitely prepared a cart in Mintra. I have prepared a cart in Urbanic. I have prepared a cart in Amazon. I have prepared a cart in Flipkart. Trust me, I swear to God, if I show you my cart, you will see that there is at least five to 10,000 rupees ka cart that I have made and I've kept it. Now, obviously, I'm not going to shop because month end is almost coming and I can't do that, right? But if I want those things, right, what do I have to do? I have to lose some, some money from my pocket, right? I'll be losing out some money and only then I'll be getting those materials, isn't it? Yes. So, basically, do you see when you have to take an electron away, when you take an electron away, the atom needs some energy. Without the energy, the atom is not going to give its electron away, right? The very same way, if I want those clothes, I will have to give away some money. Without giving away the money, how am I going to get new clothes, Baba? I cannot, right? Do you think that Mintra, Amazon and Flipkart will be like, Ay, yo, you like shopping, you take the clothes. Will they do that? No. That's what is happening. Now, if somebody, <laughs> now understand this, that now if somebody says that, you know what, give me your clothes, I'll be like, you're crazy or what? I'm not selling my clothes. I'm not giving away my clothes. And even if I am, I will require the amount of, that I paid for, right? And so, so you get my point, right? You get my point. So if I am selling, if I'm giving away my clothes, you must have seen, right? Uh, you know, your, prob your, mom, your, your, mo your mom probably does it. She gives away her old clothes and then they give utensils. Yeah utensils yes so if she is releasing her old clothes what is happening there are new things that are coming into your house that's 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 what utensils the very same way here when an atom gains an electron it gives away some energy it releases some energy so 
वॉट इज इलेक्ट्रॉन की एनेंथेल्पी द अमाउंट ऑफ एनर्जी द अमाउंट ऑफ एनर्जी रिलीज्ड बाय एन आइसोलेटेड and all of this happens in uh, isolated gaseous state the atom should not be bonded by the way it should not be bonded okay so the amount of energy released by an isolated gaseous atom when an electron is pushed into it all right okay so basically this is actually negative in nature okay and if it is highly negative if it is highly negative that means that the bond formation is going to be easy highly negative easier to gain electron okay easier to gain electron and this if it is low better low easier for bond formation okay you get my point now let's come to what is it now let's come to lattice enthalpy what is lattice enthalpy so my dear student you understand that when i say nacl i don't mean that there is only one atom of na and one atom of cl right it's probably nacl 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 everywhere it's a lattice it's a crystal lattice correct yes so lattice enthalpy means that the energy required to separate one mole of solid nacl into one mole of solid na plus in gaseous state and one mole of cl minus gaseous state to infinite distance we are separating them we are breaking them apart that is your lattice enthalpy so let's write it down okay what is lattice enthalpy the energy the energy required to separate separate one mole of solid nacl nacl 2 one mole of na plus in gaseous state and One mole of one mole of Cl minus gaseous state to an infinite distance. See, it should be infinite distance. And uh, wait a second, let me explain this. Okay, so why do we write infinite distance? Why do we write infinite distance? Well, that's because if they are closer to each other, positive will attract negative, and chui. what will happen nacl will form again so you you separate them to such a distance from where they cannot come back and form the lattice again okay and that is why we say that it is infinite distance get my point okay so what did i say obviously the ionic bonds will be formed more easily between the elements which have comparatively low ionization for energy and highly negative electron gain enthalpy only then it will be easier to form the bond in bond uh, to form the bond basically right okay get my point great easy peasy biryani tasty now that we have understood how the bond has formed let's talk about some of the bond parameters what is parameters like if i talk about myself you will ask me ma'am what's your height ma'am what's your weight ma'am what is your chashma power right so these are my parameters isn't it the same way when we talk about a bond there are certain characteristics certain properties that we want to talk about the bond so obviously bond length comes the first now do you think that bond length when you are talking about bond length do you think that it's just a line actually it's not it's not a line for our convenience to make our life easier we say that ah it must be a line it is not it's not a line okay you know that electrons are in a cloud right all of that we studied in the structure of atom it's like a wave it's like a particle and blah 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 all of that we did so how can bond be a line only not possible right but anyway what is bond length bond length is defined as the 
equilibrium distance between the nuclei of two bonded atoms. That means in a molecule, in a molecule. So let's say that we have a molecule here, right? We have a molecule. Here is an atom. Here is another atom. These two are bonded. This is your nuclei. This is your nuclei. Now from here to here, when you measure this distance, this D is your bond length, okay? This D becomes your bond length. Get my point? Yes. Now half of the bond length can be your covalent radius, correct? Half of the bond length is going to be covalent radius. However, in van der Waal radius, what do we say? We say that the bond, we say that it's non-bonded. It's an adjacent atom, but not bonded because van der Waal radius is for noble gases, right? Yes. So here is something that you have to know. You have to know that the covalent radius is measured approximately as the radius of an atom's core, radius of an atom's core, yes, which is in contact with the core of another adjacent atom. That's your covalent radius. But in case of the van der Waal radius, it represents the overall size of the atom, which includes its valence shell in a non-bonded situation. Agreed, agreed. Yes, got it. Okay. Now what is bond angle? Once again, it's not a line. Then how are we finding out the angle? Angle can be between two lines. No, that's what we have learned, isn't it? 90 degree, 120 degree, this and that and all of that angle. In mathematics, we know that it's between two lines. How come we are measuring it here? Well, here what we are saying is the angle between the orbitals. The orbitals, if it is d orbital, in the d orbital and between a p orbital, right? Okay. So, angle between the orbitals that contain the bonding electron pairs around the central metal atom in a molecule or a complex ion, that's your bond angle. Gotcha? Clear? Awesome. Next. Next one is, see, bond enthalpy. What is bond enthalpy? The energy required to break a bond. <laughs> okay. The energy that is required to break a bond, that's called as bond enthalpy. Now, what is bond order? Bond order is basically the number of bonds between the two atoms. If it is one, then single bond. If it is two, double bond. If it is three, triple bond. If it is zero, the molecule does not exist. Getting my point? If it is zero, the molecule does not exist. You get my point? Yes. Now, here is something that you need to know. Okay. So, isoelectronic molecules. What do we mean by isoelectronic molecules? That means the molecules have same number of electrons. The molecules have same number of electrons. They are called as isoelectronic molecules. So, isoelectronic molecules and isoelectronic ions, they have identical bond order. What do we mean by identical bond order? Identical bond order means they have same bond order. Ab obviously, Baba, they have the same number of electrons. Now, how will they bond? They will bond on also in the same way. So, obviously, they have identical bond order, right? Now, if the bond order increases, bond enthalpy also increases. If the bond order increases, then, acha, you tell me. If I am holding like this, single, single bond, I can easily break it, right? But if there is two bond, if there is double bond, it will require a little more energy to break. If it is triple bond, it will require a little more energy to break. Right? Yes, everybody. Are you getting my point? So, you see that whenever the bond order increases, bond enthalpy also increases. The next point says bond length decreases. What do you mean by that? See, check it, check it out. If I keep my hand like this here, see I am touching the board here, okay? I am touching the board and I can be as far as possible, right? I can be very far away. But if I have to increase the bond, now I will be like this. Now see, I am a little closer to the board. Now if I may have to make a triple bond, I will have to use my leg. I will have to come even more closer. <laughs> you get my point? So what is happening? Bond length decreases. As you increase the bond order, the bond length decreases. Okay? Alright? Get my point? Okay? Okay. Now let's understand resonance structure. You know what is resonance structure? I spoke to you about ozone, right? Check it out. See what ozone does? Yes. Here, 1, 2, 3. 3 or oxygen are there. Now, you see, either they can have a double bond here or they can have a double bond here. Right? So, basically what happens is the electron can move. Delocalization of electron. The electron does not stick to one place. The electron can move from one place to another. 
and when it is moving what happens it can either show this 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 structure or it can show that structure so the definition of resonance structure is the phenomenon of existence of a molecule in many structures that is a molecule can exist in two or three structures why because of delocalization of electron the electron moves hence you get two or three different structures get my point yeah okay Actually, now all this time we were talking about bond, bond, bond. When we spoke, we, we spoke about ionic bond or covalent bond, right? We, we said that either the transfer of electron happens or sharing of electron happens. Transfer means ionic and uh, sharing means covalent. But what if I told you that in reality it was found that there is no bond or there is no compound that is either completely covalent or it is completely ionic. It was not found. Every molecule had some percentage of ionic character and it had some percentage of char uh, covalent character. But how is this formed? How is this formed? Now we came to this thing called as bond polarity. There is something called as bond polarity. Achha, let's not read the definition now. Okay, Let me give you a story. So you all have TV in your house, right? You all watch TV. Right, and I'm pretty sure that most of you also have a sibling. You either have a brother or a sister, right? Yeah. So let me give you an example of me and my brother. I have a younger brother. He's still studying. Yeah. And he is with my parents in Guwahati. So when we were younger, my brother and I, we used to love watching this CID, you know, that ACP Pradyuman and Daya Darwaza Tordo. <laughs> so we used to watch this. And uh, there were times when we both wanted to watch the same CID show. So obviously at that time, when we took the remote, there was no fight between us. And we both are like very calmly and nicely. We're like, you know, we're being like couch potatoes and we are watching the uh, CID. But then we started to grow up a little bit, right? And when we started to grow up, now I started becoming a little cool kid. I, was, I started listening to all these English songs, right? You know, like Linkin Park and Taylor Swift and Enrique and all of that, right? But my brother was still younger than me, right? He's, he's what, five, six years old, younger than me. So, he still wanted to watch CID. Now, when I grew up and I wanted to watch something, so both of us started fighting like, no, I want the, like, no, I want the remote, no, I want the remote, no, I want the remote. We kept doing this. Now, certain times, I snatched the remote from him and I could watch the, you know, the English songs or the English movies that I was so fond of. And certain times, we fought and he won the remote. So, he took the remote and he started watching CID. So you get my point, what is happening? Certain times I was happy, certain times he was happy. But we were both not happy when we started growing up. But before that, when we were younger, we were non-polar, right? Our, our bonding was very nice because both of us were doing the same thing. So the very same way, understand this, when covalent bond is formed between two similar atoms, two similar atoms when they're bonding and the shared pair of electron is equally attracted by the two atoms just like how CID was equally attractive for both of us, me and my brother. And as a result, the remote was situated exactly between the both of us. We were like, ah, oh, sound badao, sound badao, let's increase the volume. We were increasing the volume. Eee, the sound is too much, mom will get up, mom will get up, so decrease the volume. We were doing that, both of us together. So this time the bond that was formed was what? Non-polar covalent bond, right? This, this, this was non-polar covalent bond. But when we grew up, then what happened? Now when the covalent bond is formed, okay, let's write it down. Yeah, now, now let's write it down. Here what we have to write is when, when covalent bond, when covalent bond is formed, is formed between two, dissimilar atoms the shared pair of electron the shared pair of electron is not equally is not equally attracted 
by the atoms. By the two atoms. As a result, as a result, the electron pair is electron pair is situated is situated closer to one of the atoms this is called as polar covalent bond this is polar covalent bond you get my point yes okay so now 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 understand this so when there are two charges yes now what happened i snatched the remote from my brother towards me right i snatched the remote here what is happening basically there are two charges right imagine this when i snatched the remote let's consider the remote to be an electron what what happened to me i became negatively charged i became negatively charged and because i snatched away the remote my brother was positive so equal and opposite charge when they are when they have a distance when they are separated by a distance what do you call it dipole moment yes equal and opposite charge separated by a distance is called dipole moment am i right am i right everybody yes guys correct yes now here comes your this is your mu is equal to q into d this is how you calculate dipole moment and the unit of dipole moment as you all know it is d by what is it d by okay all right now here you have something called as bf3 this is the structure of bf3 now you have to understand my dear student that in dipole moment dipole moment is a vector quantity right it's a vector quantity so here what happens some of the dipole moments of various bonds happen yes now it is not only dependent on the it's not only dependent on what exactly the dipole moment is but also the spatial arrangement of the molecule yes now understand this in case of bf3 so this di this vector and this vector the resultant will be this side some of the two vectors here resultant will be this side now when there is this vector here and this vector here this will be equal in opposite so the dipole moment would be zero dipole moment would be zero are you understanding yes yes are you getting my point correct everybody yes so what what did i say that in case of a polyatomic molecule the dipole moment does not depend upon the individual dipole moment of bonds it does not depend upon this dipole bond or this dipole bond it depends upon the spatial arrangement of various bonds in the molecules now because how they are arranged like this in the space so this plus this resultant will be this side and this is equally opposite to this so the dipole moment will be zero getting it understood okay great then great 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 all right now moving on there is something else also now we come to something called as fajan's rule everybody in india a lot of people call it fajan's rule fajan's rule fajan's rule please understand it's not fajan's rule it's called as fajan's rule j is pronounced as y okay fajan's rule before we get to fajan's rule you have to understand the polarizing power and the power of you know polarizability what are these terms let's understand bachcha so understand that there is a cation the cation is basically the positive charged ion right and the anion is negatively charged ion so the cation let's say is coming to coming to the anion 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 right yes now imagine that the cation is very charged the cation has a lot of positive charge so the moment it has lot of positive charge what will happen from the anion many negative charge will be like whoa whoa opposite attract 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 they will start getting attracted so this one will get distorted the anion shape will get distorted the anion will be like oh negative 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 let's go right yes uh, sorry positive 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 let's go yes yes so basically what is happening is the cation has a polarizing power the cation is distorting the shape of the anion it's calling it towards it like come 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 let's neutralize each other 
Are you understanding? Yes. So the power of cation to polarize the anion is called polarizing power. And what is polarizability? The tendency of anion to get catalyzed. Now the anion can also be like, hmm, I don't want to be an. I don't want to be polarized. Then what? The tendency of the polarizability is less. If the anion is also like super excited, whoa, 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 let's, let's, let's get polarized, let's get polarized. If it's tilting like this, then the polarizability is more. Are you understanding? So the tendency of anion to get polarized is called polarizability. Now you have to understand that greater is the polarization. If the cation can polarize the anion and more number of, you know, more number of charges are getting neutralized, then the ionic character is less because now they are forming a covalent bond, right? Covalent bond, sharing, sharing is happening. So this positive came, this negative came here, they neutralized each other. No ionic. For ion, you need the charges, right? For ionic bond to exist, you need the positive charge or the negative charge. <laughs> it's not there, only they have neutralized. Now the covalent character is more, ionic character is less. But if that's not the case, then the ionic character is more, covalent character is less. Understand it with this example, yeah? Here is a polar covalent, like, like this, see? How this dog came, but this one is a great Dane, right? This one is a great Dane, it's a bigger dog. What it did was, it pulled the bone towards itself, see? It pulled the bone towards itself. Are you understanding? Exactly. See, here also, here also hydrogen and fluorine. See, hydrogen had one electron. So, what fluorine did was fluorine pulled the electron towards its mode. Hydrogen could not do that. Hydrogen could not pull electrons from fluorine though. But fluorine did because fluorine is more electronegative. Fluorine wants to gain electron easily, right? Because it wants to attain that octet rule. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, here what is happening? More polarization of fluorine. Fluorine can polarize the hydrogen atom. Getting my point? Now that you have understood all of these, now let's understand what Fayan said. Fayan said that, okay, Fayan said that the smaller the size of the cation, if the cation is very small, then, then and if the anion size is big, then the covalent character of an ionic bond will be more. Getting my point? Getting my point? Cation is small, anion is big. Then the bond that is created, of course it's ionic bond, but the covalent character is more here. Okay? Yes? Now, second point he said was, greater the charge on the cation, and greater the covalent character of the ionic bond. If the cation has a lot of charge, let's say it's 2 plus, it's 3 plus. If the cation is 2 plus, 3 plus, then what will happen? The covalent character of the ionic bond will be more. Basically, it will be leaning towards covalent bond more. And then for cations of the same size and charge, man lo, imagine that there is one cation, there is another cation. Same size, same charge, 2 plus, 2 plus. Now, which one will you consider more polar? Which one do you think that has more polarizing power? Which one will be able to polarize more? Now comes this line. Understand this. The electronic configuration that has n minus 1, d to the power n, n is 0. That means it has to be a, it has to be a transition metal. If it is a transition metal, then the polarizing power will be more. Yes. Then the polarizing power will be more. But if it is a alkali or alkaline earth metal, for example, NS2NP6, if it is a alkali or alkaline earth metal, then the polarizing power will be less than the transition metal. You get it? Yes, it will be less than the transition metal. So what is the gist of it? The gist of it, Fayan said that just like, just as all the covalent bond have some partial ionic character, Ionic bonds also have some partial covalent character. And this partial covalent character of ionic bond was discussed by Fayan's rule. Getting it? Yes. Now, Fayan's rule, very important. Please do remember SCLA. SCLA. This is the first rule. SCLA. Like UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles. Like that you remember SCLA, School of, uh, you know, Los Angeles, let's say, okay. 
School of California, Los Angeles. Basically, that means that what? Smaller cation, large anion, polarizing power more. Remember this. It's very important. <laughs> Remember this. Even for your S block, for your P block, for your DNF block, this is very important. The first rule you have to, you got to remember it, okay? All right, everybody? Now, guys, let's move on towards our IIT JEE mains and advanced questions. So, here comes VSEPR theory. By the way, guys, we do have questions. We do have questions. This was very easy. This was only board level. So, hence, I did not do much question. And also, of course, we will have some problem solving classes as well. But first, let's read this. So, VSEPR theory. What happens in VSEPR theory? VSEPR theory, you know what is the full form of VSEPR theory? Yes or no? No? Yes? Let me tell you. <laughs> VSEPR theory is valence shell. Valence shell. Electron pair. Electron pair repulsion theory okay the answer is right here what is vsepr theory if somebody asks you the answer is right here the answer says that valence shell last electron shell last shell in which the electron is valence shell they will come closer but electron and electron are the ones they form the bond but they are both of the same charge and we know from the very beginning of our education that, elect that like charges repel each other. So, an electron pair and an electron pair they will repel. That is it. Valence shell, last electron shell. They will come together to form bond but electron and electron are going to form the bond. But both of them are what? Like charges like charges will repel each other and that is our VSEPR theory. In short form, we also call it Vesper theory. Okay. All right. So, we understood this. Now, Vesper theory says that the shape of a molecule, what is going to be the shape of a molecule? The shape of a molecule will actually depend upon the number of valence shell electron pair, bonded or and non-bonded around the central atom. So, if you have an atom, you have an atom, in the atom, how many valence shell electrons are there? Are they bonded? Are they non-bonded? Based on that, your molecule shape, you can find out. Okay? Understanding this much? This is your first point. First point is done. What is the first point? The shape of the molecule. What will be the shape of the molecule? Will depend on how many last shell, how many electrons are there in the last shell. Are they bonded? Are they non-bonded? That's it. Okay. Second one says that the pairs of electron in the valence shell, they will repel one another because obviously electron clouds, all of them are negatively charged and we know that like charges repel each other. Right? Unlike charges attract each other. Correct? We know this from the very, very junior grade. Right? Now it says that these pair of electron, they occupy such positions so that the repulsion is minimum. For example, imagine if I am getting a shock from this, from this, uh, you know, the board. What will I do? I will not touch it, right? I will stay away. Now, in such a position that I am still visible, the board is still visible and I am not touching it, so I am not getting a shock of my life. This is my position. At this position, the shock I am not getting, I have minimized the shock. And I am also visible in the camera. So, right here I am. This is my position. And this will decide, this is deciding how I am standing in the class. Right? Exactly. This is what it said. It said that the pair of electrons, they tend to occupy, they stay in such positions where the space, in, in the space, they, they tend to occupy such positions in space where the repulsion between the electron cloud is a minimum. Okay? Yes? And they can maximize the distance between them. There should be like maximum distance, less repulsion. They are happy. Got it? Now, you know what? VSEPR theory, it was actually, I think, uh, proposed by someone called as uh, Sidgwick and Powell, if I am not wrong. I think it was proposed by Sidgwick and Powell. 
फर्स्ट टाइम इट वॉज प्रपोज बाई सिजविक एंड पोवेल सेकेंड टाइम आई थिंक इट वॉज गिवन बाय हो गेव इट हो गेव इट वॉज नाई होम एंड नाई होम एंड 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 गिलस्पी यस यस दे डेवलप्ड इट दे डेवलप्ड इट नाई होम I hope I have written the right spelling. If you want, you can check it from your uh, NCERT. I think you'll find it. Okay. So Nihom and Gillespie. I think about nineteen. Uh, I remembered it as ten uh, years after our independence, nineteen fifty-seven. Nineteen forty-seven is when we got independence, right? Nineteen fifty-seven is when they uh, when they developed it, and nineteen forty was when Sidgwick and Powell had given it up. I mean, they they said that this is how it is going to look like. Okay. so moving on now now what happened is the valence shell is taken in a sphere so you say that the last shell the last shell is actually a sphere okay the last shell is actually a sphere all right and with the electron pairs localizing on the spherical surface so what happens is if the electron pair is here if the electron pair is let's say here and here and there is another electron cloud that is here okay let's say that here also you have an electron so what will this do this one will delocalize and go here this one will move from here to here because maximum distance maximum distance not even maximum distance to make maximum distance it will actually go here it will actually go here maximum distance it wants right so it will delocalize it will move away from the from that electron okay both of them would will do what now this one also won't stay here this will also delocalize and come here they will say that babba maximum distance no worries I don't want to fight with you. At maximum distance from one another, they will survive. Okay. Now, a multiple bond. In this case, if there are double bond or triple bond, you are not going to consider them as double bond or triple bond. What will you do? You will consider them. Okay, two or three electron pair of multiple bond. You will treat them as a single super pair. No worries. You have multiple bond. You have double bond. Doesn't matter. Here, you are going to take them as one single super pair got it please listen to this don't you think that this can be a limitation later on it will be it will be a limitation but you understand right here what are we saying multiple bonds are treated as single super pair okay now if there are two or more resonance structure in that case you can use vscpr theory and you can apply it to any such structure and find the shape how are they going to exist which actually is the structure you can easily find it from vsepr theory makes sense nonsense makes sense right in case of vsepr theory there is another thing you have to understand that a lone pair lone pair repulsion you know what is lone pair right those which are non bonded so a lone pair lone pair repulsion is maximum a lone pair the non bonded one so understand this my dear student if you are in a family do you fight a lot no but single single people in the hostel if you put all of it when you all go to hostel what will you do you will do tandav right you will fight you will have fun you will go out you will bunk classes you will go out of the hostel campus at night and all of this but can you do the same thing at home also you can but you will still be scared that hey yeah if mom and dad get out then you will get the shock of the life right yes so understand that when you are lone pair lone pair when you are not bonded to anyone in the hostel the fight the fun everything will be more right but if there is a lone pair and a bond pair if you have let's say there is a lone lone pair like you and there is also a bond pair let's say that two hostels a married couple hostel and your hostel where all the single people are there right <laughs> between them you will not fight so much you will not have fight so much you can also not have fun so much why because the moment you start shouting they will be like call to warden tit 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 warden this hostel is shouting too much that will happen so you cannot have fun so much you cannot also have you you cannot fight so much also because lone pair bond pair warden will come and they will sort it out correct yes so lone pair bond pair will happen here yes and then finally what happens now imagine that you all are in a family what will happen the fight fun everything is less here because you are bonded right sometimes you want to do something on your on on a sunday but let's just say that your mom or your dad they have work they cannot take you so what will happen bond pair bond pair fun will be 
Lit, I'm not saying that it is, but just an example, yeah, just an example, okay, just saying, please don't blast on me and say this, ma'am, you're giving a stereotypical example, just an example, okay. All right, everybody, so understand, this is the gist of your VECPR theory. Easy peasy, biryani tasty, looking like it, great, crystal clear, yes, do write down some la 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 or EPBT in the comment section so that I know that you all are understanding this, okay. All right, all right, guys, moving on then, now coming to VECPR theory, understand this, that so, 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 so what happens is, so what happens is, take a look at it. Here you have a lone pair. Here you have a lone pair. See, this lone pair, it has pushed the bond pair together. But because bond pair and bond pair repulsion is less, they can exist with a very small bond angle also, 104.5 degree. They can exist very nicely, okay. But here do you see the angle is much more, why? Because bond pair can push the, because lone pair can push the bond pair a little more. But bond pair, bond pair repulsion is less. But imagine if you have two lone pair now. Imagine if you have two lone pair. Do you think that it will be like this? Actually, it will be even more further away, okay? It will be even more further away. It will be even more further away and these two will come closer. These two will come closer. So the lone pair, lone pair repulsion will be maximum. Then it will be lone pair, bond pair and the bond pair, bond pair repulsion is the least, okay? It is the least. Are you getting it? Yes. For the prediction of geometrical shapes of molecules with the help of VCPR theory, it is always convenient. It will always be easier for you if you divide the molecule in two categories. How? What are the categories? Molecule in which the central atom has no lone pair. There are two cases, okay? Two cases. Let me write down. What did I say? I said that. Molecule in which, molecule in which there is no lone pair, molecule in which zero lone pair and molecule with lone pair. Okay. So, if we divide it into these two categories, it becomes a little easier for us to find the shape. So, shall, shall we check out now? What, what shapes are we getting? Yes, how the molecules are going to look like? Chal, let's go. So, geometry in which there is no lone pair. There are no lone pair of electrons in the central atom. Okay, the central atom, whatever electrons it had, it had already shared. Everything is bonded, 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 bonded. No lone pair at all. So, take a look at it. Now, if the number of electron pairs are 2, there are 2 electron pairs, okay, yes, arrangement of electron will be linear, do you see, yes, do you see everybody, linear, this is A is your central atom, here you have one atom, here you have one atom, so the shape will be linear, okay, example is BeCl2, how do you draw BeCl2, like this, BeCl, Cl, beryllium has only 2 electrons, so 1 here, 1 here, Cl has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. Okay. This is your BeCl2. HgCl2 also you can draw the same way. Okay. Now, if number of electron pairs are 3. 3 number of electron player. <laughs> player it seems. If there are 3 electron pairs, then the shape is going to be trigonal planar. That means central atom at the center, A here and then B, B, B. Okay, and the and the and then the angle. Please do learn this also. 180 degree, 1 120 degree. Okay, learn it. Now here is the example. BF3. Okay, how do you draw BF3? See here. B. Okay. F. F. And here will be another F. So boron has three electrons in the valence shell. One, two, three. All the three are shared. Now fluorine has one, two, three, four, five, six. 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. Octet is also completed, okay. This is your BF3, got it? Now we come to 4 number of electron pairs. If there are 4 electron pairs, what will we do? If there are 4 electron player, player again it seems, pair, then the shape is going to be, molecular geometry is going to be tetrahedral, okay. For example, you have CH4. So, C is your central atom. You will have H here. Okay. Then you will have one H here. You will have another H here and you will have another H here. 
so when you draw all of these when you draw a line like this you will find that this is like a tetrahedral what is it this is like a tetrahedral okay ch4 is tetrahedral nh4 plus is also tetrahedral now you have five electron pairs okay five electron pairs now what do you do now your shape becomes trigonal bipyramidal that means at the plane here you have a triangle trigonal here you have a trigonal one pyramid here one pyramid at the bottom so trigonal bipyramid okay imagine it trigonal here is your trigonal and there is a bi here is a pyramid on the top here is a pyramid on the top okay so that's your bipyramidal basically it will be like this okay see here p okay then you have a cl here you have a cl here and then you will have one cl here one cl here one cl here so you see how these three form a trigonal then this forms a pyramid this also forms a pyramid understood yes it forms trigonal bipyramidal if there are six electron pairs it will form octahedral what will it form it will form octahedral sf6 is an example of octahedral okay all right guys making sense nonsense makes sense right now if there are seven electron pairs it will be pentagonal bipyramidal that means that take a look at it so how will i draw it is i here okay then here will be 1f here will be 1f okay now what will i do is here 1f here 1f okay then 1 2 3 4 4 done okay yes then here 1f here 1f and finally here also 1f so basically when i close all of these it will be like this Does this not look like a pentagon? Yes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 sides. And then from here you will see that this goes and becomes like a pyramid. And from here this goes and this becomes like a pyramid. So it will be pentagonal by pyramidal. Got it? Got it everybody? Understood? Now let's take a look at in which the central atom has one or more lone pair. Okay. Now this time you have one or more lone pair. Okay. There are lone pair with the central atom basically. There are those electrons which are not bonded. Okay, There are remaining electrons that are not bonded to the other electrons. Okay, Now in this case, what if you have two bond pairs but one lone pair? Only one lone pair. So 2 plus 1 it becomes 3, right? Yes, the steric number is 3, no? 2 plus 1, 3, correct? Now check out my dear students. Yes, in this case also, what was the shape of the 3? Shape of 3 was trigonal planar. Here also it is going to be trigonal planar. Just, just hide this. When you hide the lone pair, you see that it is a trigonal planar. It is a triangle and it is in the same plane. Okay. Example is SO2 or O3, ozone or sulfur dioxide. Basically, if I have to make it, see how will I make it? It will be sulfur here. Sulfur has two lone pair here like this. Here will be one oxygen. Here will be one oxygen. SO2. Hide this. Hide this. What do you see? Trigonal planar. That's it. Bus. Okay. Now let's say that there are three bond pairs but one lone pair. Once again when you hide this, how does it look like? This looks like a pyramid, right? This looks like a pyramid. So this you will call it as trigonal pyramidal the shape is trigonal pyramidal but arrangement of electron is tetrahedral here there are two terms by the, by the way two terms the shape is different arrangement of electron is different a little confusing but you will get it how is the how is the atom how is the electron arranged you see here you have a lone pair here you have a lone pair but here is the all the three bonded pair now if you take a look at it how does it look like see this looks like a pyramid right it looks like a pyramid isn't it yes so we say that it is trigonal by, by pyramidal not bipyramidal tri trigonal pyramidal and example is nh3 okay example is nh3 got it all right then we go to the next one now we have two bond pairs two lone pairs okay two bond pair two lone pairs steric number four okay steric number four that means see 3 plus 1, steric number 4, tetrahedral. 2 plus 2, steric number 4, tetrahedral. 
Steric 4 is tetrahedral. Remember, I will show you that chart also. I have that. I have that. So, 4 is tetrahedral. Okay. But this time, again, now, now close this. Close this two lone pair. What do you see? Bent shape. This one and this one is the same shape. Right. See? This one and this one. Same bent shape. What is the example? H2O. Water has a bent shape. Water has a bent shape. Okay. All right, everybody. Getting my point? Okay, great. Moving on from here now. Now, what if you have four bond pairs and one lone pair? This time, it is four plus one. Five. Steric number four means trigonal bipyramidal. Basically, you just close this. What shape do you see? When you close this, it actually looks like somewhat like this, right? B and B and then B and B, right? This, doesn't it look like a seesaw? And exactly what we wrote, seesaw. SF4, seesaw. Great, okay? Now we go to 3 plus 2. Once again, steric number is 5. Steric number 5, same arrangement. See, trigonal bipyramidal, trigonal bipyramidal. But this time, the shape becomes... T shape. See, close these two lone pair. What do you see? If you close these two, T shape and exactly what we have written here. T shape. CLF3 has T shape. Okay. Okay. This is also called as an interhalogen compound. Okay. What is it called as? Interhalogen compound. Halogen and halogen together they are compound. See, chlorine is a halogen, fluorine is a halogen. Two halogens together, interhalogen compound. We will read about it in P block. Don't worry. Okay. Moving on. Now we have steric number 6. Steric number 6 octahedral, remember? SF6. SF6 was also octahedral. Same here also, see? Octahedral. 5 plus 1, 6. 6 becomes a square pyramidal. How square pyramidal? We are going to close this. What do you have? You have a square here. You have a square here, right? And you have a pyramid here, see? Square pyramidal, correct? Absolutely. Yes? Now here what happens? 4 plus 2, 6. Steric number 6. Steric number 6 means octahedral. But this time you have two lone pairs. So close the lone pair. What do you have? You have square. All of it is in the same plane. So square planar. Square planar. And the example of is XeF4. Xenon tetrafluoride. XeF4. Okay. Now I have the chart here. Please do remember it. Steric number 2, linear. Steric number 3, trigonal planar. Steric number 4, tetrahedral. Steric number 5, trigonal bipyramidal. Steric number 6, octahedral. Steric number 7, pentagonal bipyramidal. So, bipyramidal is only in two cases, 5 and 7. Okay. 5 and 7, 6 is octahedral, 4 is tetrahedral, 3 is trigonal planar, 2 is linear. Got it? Now, let's solve a question. Shall we solve a question? Let's solve a question, everybody. Chal. Which of the following has a geometry that is different from all the other three species? You are the same having the same geometry, okay? Chalo, BF4, boron, right? Boron has three electrons, correct? Boron has three electrons, right? In the valence shell, B and then Al, right? Boron, aluminium, correct, okay? But fluorine has, okay, so BF4, right? You have four here, you have one F here, you have one F here, you have one F here. And it says 4 minus. Minus. There is one electron extra. One electron extra. Hence minus. So that means 4 electrons. All of them are done. Yes. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And this I can write it as minus. Okay. Now how many bond pairs do I have? I have 4 bond pairs. 4 bond pairs. Yes, zero lone pair. Yes, four bond pairs. That means steric number four. Steric number four is what? Tetrahedral. Steric number four is a tetrahedral. SP3 hybridization and this is a tetrahedral. Got it? Tetrahedral, SP3 hybridization. Great. Now we have SO4 2 minus. Okay, so sulfur. Sulfur is our central atom. Sulfur has also 6. O, S, oxygen and then sulfur. Sulfur has 6. Oxygen also has 6. So, 4. Let's do it. What it will do is it will form 2 double bond with oxygen here. 2 double bond with oxygen here. 6 plus 2, 8. Right. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Right. Then you have 1 oxygen here. 1 oxygen here. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then here it will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Huh. Done? All done? Yes. Now this for here I can write it as 2 minus. Does it have any lone pair left? Does it have any lone pair left? 0. So once again you have 4 bond pair, 0 lone pair, 0 lone pair. Steric number 4 again that means tetrahedral everybody. Tetrahedral. Yes. Alright everybody. Tetrahedral. Once again what do I write? SP3 hybridization. Correct. Great. For XCF4 let's do it. For XCF4 let's do it. Okay. Xenon. Xenon has how many? Xenon has uh, 8 electrons. Right. So that means 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. Then here let's do F, 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 F. Okay. Alright. So that means there will be 2 lone pairs here. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 bond pairs. So 4 BP and sorry, 0 I wrote again. 2 LP, 4 BP, 2 LP. Steric number is 6. 6 here, that means that it will be, look at this. This will be square planar, right? This will be square planar. Square planar, okay? But steric number 6 should be octahedral, but this is square planar, alright? So that means this is the case, my dear student. pH 4 plus will again be, take a look at it, P, it will be P, right? pH 4 plus. P has actually 5 valence electrons, but it is 4 plus. I mean, pH 4 plus. So that means one electron is gone. It will be H, H here, H here, H here. And then together you can just write plus. So this will also be tetrahedral. Answer is XEF4. Correct only. Correct. We did it right only. Yeah. By the way, in this case, what is the hybridization? Hybridization will be SP3 and D2. Yes. SP3, D2 hybridization. Okay. Chalo. All right, guys. Moving on then. Achha, oh, the solution is here also. This is a cleaner diagram if you want. You can check it out. Chalo. Now we have PCL4 plus PCL4 minus and ASCL5. Chalo, what do we have? We have PCL4 plus PCL4 minus and we have ASCL5, right? ASCL5, PCL4 plus PCL4 minus. Chalo, let's draw it. So, phosphorus has how many? P has 5 valence electrons but it is plus it is plus so one electron gone that means that we can write it as we can write it as how can we write it it will be um, cl 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 and cl together here let's write plus here yes so this is what this will be tetrahedral this will be tetrahedral pcl4 minus five electrons it already has but here it will be extra so let's write it this Let's write it like this, okay? This will be there and then Cl4, right? So, Cl, Cl, Cl and Cl. How does this look like? This looks like a seesaw shape. Seesaw shape. Obviously, it can be a little better, but uh, come on. I'm not this thing, okay? I'm not uh, Einstein. Uh, not Einstein, sorry. I'm not Pablo Picasso. I can't draw that well, <laughs> okay? All right, so this means that this is PCL4 minus, okay? Now we have AS. AS will have how much? Acetine. No, not acetine. Sorry, arsenic, right? Yes. ASCL5. It has only 5. So that means that it will be ASCL5, okay? CL5. So um, like this, CL, 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 CL. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, this will be, my dear students, trigonal bipyramidal. Yes. What will it be? Trigonal bipyramidal. Alright. So, that means that tetrahedral seesaw and trigonal bipyramidal option B is the correct one. <laughs> Easy peasy. Biryani tasty. Makes sense? No sense. Makes sense, right? Great. Here is the better this thing, okay, better scenario of it here, okay. Chalo then. Now, let's move on towards something called as hybridization. Obviously, VSEPR theory also did not make much sense at certain point because there was some limitation. So, now we say that hybridization. What is hybrid? Hybrid you know, right? What is hybrid, my dear students? 
yeah don't we do that like we we pluck like rose plant and then we mix it with some uh, mix it with jasmine and we create something out of it which smells like rose also and jasmine also and the flower looks a little different right we we take some cabbage and then we uh, mix it with broccoli and make maybe make something else i mean that that's what is hybrid right where we mix two things isn't it we mix two things and we make we get a we get something else that's your hybrid so same thing like that use the same analogy and uh, bring it to your chemistry what do you think here what we are doing is obviously we are not mixing dog and wolf and you know cabbage and broccoli and rose and jasmine here we are mixing orbitals so d orbital has more energy p orbital has less energy s has even more less energy right how about let's bring all of them together let's bring all of them together yes they have slightly different energies so we are going to bring them all together we are intermixing them we are going to mix them all together now what happens is a little bit from p goes into s s and little bit from d goes into p so a redistribution of their energy is happen right what is happening a redistribution of energies are going to happen here and then they form a new set of orbitals where they have equivalent energies and shape now this time they have equivalent energies and shape the energy and the shape is similar here what is happening see this is an s orbital this is a p orbital together they are mixing now you have together sp hybrid orbital what do you have you have sp hybrid orbital and s atomic orbital and p atomic orbital they intermix together and they formed sp hybridization which is why you saw sp3 d2 hybridization sp3 hybridization sp2 hybridization why do we use the word hybridization that means that we have intermixed them we have redistributed their energy and we got something where our energy is equivalent and the shape is also same now yes now let's talk about the salient features the characteristic of hybridization what are we getting out of it what are we getting out of hybridization the number of hybrid orbitals is equal to the number of atomic orbitals that get hybridized the number of hybrid orbitals is equal to the number of atomic orbitals that get hybridized uh, understanding number of hybrid orbitals means let's say that 1 plus 1 plus 1 what will we get we will get three atomic orbitals 1 plus 1 plus 1 is what three right now you will be getting three atomic orbitals that get hybridized three atomic orbitals got hybridized okay the hybridized orbitals they are always equivalent in energy and shape their shape will look same their energies will be same getting my point yes getting my point okay now the hybrid orbitals are more effective in forming a stable bonds than the pure atomic orbitals so sometimes what we have seen is even in nature even in nature right people usually say that uh, if your dna gets more mutant right if you, if you have like uh, if you have variety in dna so if if your dna's have got hybridized that means your survival you know your survival how do i say um, survival of the fittest is what darwin said so they say that you are more fit your chances of survival are more so very same way here also what they are saying is yes when are they able to form a stable bond when the orbitals are hybrid rather than a pure atomic orbital when they are hybridized when they have equivalent energies when they have almost the same shape that's when they are more stable getting my point and then the fourth salient feature is that these hybrid orbitals they are directed in space in some preferred direction they have their own set of direction that they want to follow some of them want to go this side some of them want to go that side some of them want to go this side and it's okay they have their own preferred direction where the minimum repulsion between electron pairs happen and that is why a stable arrangement is obtained which is why the type of hybridization also indicates the geometry of the molecule so now from the hybridization you can find the geometry of the molecule you getting my point yes now let's see types of hybridization see if s and p if s and p orbitals get 
hybridized you can have sp hybridization sp2 hybridization or sp3 hybridization okay if there is s p and d hybrid if there are three orbitals s p and d then you can have s p 3 d s p 3 d 2 and s p 3 d 3 okay all right everybody now finally you know what there is nothing that does not have an s character or p character every bond has certain percentage of s character certain percentage of p character so if you have s orbital only then the percentage of S character will be 100%. If you have only P orbital, then the percentage of S character will be obviously 0%, right? If you have SP, then what will happen? 50%, 50%, right? 50% will be S character, 50% will be P character. If you have SP2, then 100% will be divided into 3. That means that S character will be 33%. Now, what if you have sp3, sp3 that means there are 4 orbitals here. So, that means that it will be 25%. Getting it? Yes? Alright? So, basically, here is something else also that you have to understand and that is that more the s character, okay, more the s character percent, the bond length is less. And more s character means more electronegative. So, let's just write it down, okay? Let me just write that down here. This is a trick that you can always use. What did I say? I said that more S character percentage. Yes. What did I say? Bond length is less. All right. Yes. And the second point that I said is, the second point that I said is, more S character means more electronegativity, okay. If there is more S character, that means that more electronegative it is. Okay, alright guys, get it understood? Chal, moving on, let's do a question here. What do you all say? Let's do a question here. The question is the hybridization and the geometry of BRF3 molecules are. Okay, BRF3, bromine it is, yes. Bromine and F3, correct? Okay. So, let's take a look at it. BR, yes, BR. Bromine and uh, fluorine, both of them are in the chlorine, fluorine, chlorine, fluorine, bromine, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, right? So, that means there are 7 electrons. So, 1, 2, yes, 1, 2. Then uh, it will be 3, 4, 5, right? 5, no, it has to be 7. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and uh, 7, right? Yes. So, instead of drawing it like this, if there are 7 electrons, that means that... Uh, Seven electrons, right? So that means that there will be one here, one lone pair here, then F, then F, and then F. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Done? Everything clear? So that means that what will it be? It will be SP3. D will also be present, right? SP3D and T-shaped. Option A is the correct answer. Make sense? Make sense, right? Yeah, absolutely correct. You guys got it. You guys got it. Yes. Okay. Now, moving on from here, let's do another question. The incorrect geometry is represented by incorrect geometry, my dear students. So, that means that N, let's do it for the first one. N is, uh, N has five, five electrons, right? 5 electrons, so 1, 2 here, yes, 1 lone pair and then it will be F, F, F. Is this trigonal planar? No, right? It's not trigonal planar, correct? So, option A is our correct answer. Option A is our correct answer. It is not, it is 
trigonal pyramidal everybody if i stop this then this looks like a pyramid isn't it so it will be trigonal pyramidal and sp3 hybridization gotcha everybody great and amazing so this is where we stop with vscpr theory and hybridization now where do we go we go to valence bond theory okay so what is valence bond theory valence bond theory is basically valence bond theory you also get to learn about it in coordination compounds but here valence bond theory is basically you have to understand this that a a a metal right a metal what do, what do they do is they will first empty their d orbital then they will give it to the then they will give it to those who are incoming and who wants to fill their electrons right they will first empty it then they will hybridize it and then they will give it to the other ones to fill it this is bbt three things i said first empty the d orbital hybridize it and then give it for filling like hey come fill it that's it now in valence bond theory let's read this and let's understand to form a covalent bond overlapping occurs between half filled valence shell orbitals of the two atom what is happening overlapping occurs between half filled valence shell orbitals of the two atoms okay resulting bond acquires a pair of electrons with opposite spin you know that remember structure of atom atom we got to know that in an orbital no two electrons can have all the all the quantum number quantum numbers to be same right spin has to be opposite so opposite spin makes sense yes resulting bond will acquire a pair of electrons with opposite spin, spin to get stability it cannot have the same spin anyway right now the orbitals they come closer to each other from the direction in which they think that there will be maximum overlapping they want maximum overlapping bhai maximum overlapping is a necessity here so now that means we are saying that the covalent bond has directional character what did we say we said that covalent bond has directional character that means covalent bond has direction all right and the extent of overlapping the more amount of overlapping happens more is the strength of the chemical bond obviously if i am not touching like this if only this much is happening that means you can easily break it if the overlapping happens like this now can you break it you will have to push the other one slide it off and only then you will be able to break it off right yes so you get it what is it what does it say it's saying five things okay five things basically what to form a covalent bond overlapping happens between what half filled valence shell orbital of the two atoms second it's saying is a second second point is resulting bond acquires a pair of electrons with opposite spins okay whatever bond you have created the electrons will be of opposite spins you know that in a bond whenever i make a bond let's say c and there is o so this will be like this and this will be like this there will be two opposite bond two opposite spins okay get it second point third one is orbitals they come closer from that direction in which they think maximum overlapping will happen they want maximum overlapping they can come like this they can come like this they can come like this but maximum overlapping is necessary fourth one they say covalent bond is directional great obviously it's coming from different direction and the fifth point is more is the overlapping more is the chemical bond strength we got it yes great amazing then amazing now moving on okay extent of overlapping depends on two factors okay one is nature of orbital nature of orbital see you understand that s orbital is is just the sphere right so what direction are we talking about it's just the sphere non directional okay because it is non directional if there is s orbital involved there is always less overlapping but for p d and f you know how the p d and f look like yes p looks like a dumbbell d looks like double dumbbell f is in even more complicated so in these cases there is more overlapping p d and f has more overlapping s is just a sphere it's non directional less overlapping gotcha great next one is nature of orbital Na sorry nature of overlapping so nature of orbital we understood p d and f has more uh, more more uh, overlapping s has less overlapping nature of overlapping now see if it is 
you know how the how is the earth guys the earth is lo earth looks like this right this is your equatorial and this is your axis correct this is your axis correct this is your axis right so if it is coaxial if this is your axis now let's say there is another one who is coming like here only if it is coaxial then the overlapping is more okay then the overlapping is more if it is collateral like say this is the one and there is another one then the extent of overlapping is less okay extent of overlapping is less now if it is p and p if it is p and p then the overlapping extent is more if it is p and s it is a little less if it is s and s it's even more less okay all right if it's it's even more less now there are three different types of overlapping there is positive overlapping there is negative overlapping and there is zero overlapping when two atoms when they come close to each other there is a overlapping of atomic orbitals right but the atomic orbital overlapping can be of three types it can be positive overlap it can be negative overlap it can be zero zero means no overlap obviously zero means nothing no overlapping has happened at all okay so what is positive overlap what is negative overlap let's understand okay so if i make this p orbital okay see this is my z axis guys this is my z axis here this is my z axis on this axis i have drawn a p orbital i have made a p orbital so what will i call it i will call it pz make sense nonsense make sense right this is my z orbital i have made pz hai na okay so pz now from here s is coming now check it out check it out positive positive same phase positive phase positive phase same phase everybody yes same phase everyone if it is a same phase okay if the interaction is happening between same phase then we call it a positive or in phase overlapping now check it out this is again z axis there is a pz here there is a pz from here this side okay what is happening positive positive again so it is a positive phase now whenever there is a positive overlapping the bond is formed that time whenever there is a positive overlapping see it is written bond is formed bond is formed during positive overlapping now see it can also form it can also form this is what this is not coaxial okay this is not coaxial this is what collateral collateral like this this is the p this is the p they are coming together here see the overlapping is less right but here what can happen it can go like this yes overlapping is more here what is happening overlapping is less but positive positive if it like this then see bond is not forming if it is like this bond can form it can also be like this py py this is your px px on z axis what will happen this is your x axis right and this is your y axis correct so see this is your x axis this is your y axis these two are px px here collateral overlapping has happened bond has formed here see this is your z axis i just drew it and told you that this is your y axis see py py here also bond has formed now understand negative okay see a negative and a positive pz and s here what is happening bond is not formed positive and negative once again pz pz both are pz but they are out of phase they are out phase here what is happening they are interacting but it's opposite the orbital is only opposite so here no bond is formed here see see i just showed you no this like this if it is happening like this here no bond can form no bond can form it's opposite okay no bond can form here also plus minus plus minus out phase no bond is formed and it can also be zero overlapping for example see here this is but at this phase at this place right at this curve right at this curve right at this node to find an electron is what do you remember nodes at this place you are hardly you are rarely going to find an electron so even if there is an even if it is coming like this zero no overlapping no overlapping okay when the orientation of two interacting orbital is such that there is no overlapping of the orbital we call it zero overlapping 
if it doesn't matter if they are out phase or in phase it doesn't matter if it is positive or negative but that means that zero overlapping see this is your px and this is your py no overlapping they are coming they are already from you know they are absolutely in two direction if this is your x this is your y how will they overlap can they overlap there is no overlapping no overlapping see getting my point okay all right now now we come to something called as type of overlap and bond so covalent bond forms right covalent bond forms when a covalent bond forms you just saw that coaxial and collateral right either it can be like this or it can be like this so that means when it is head on collision like this when two heads are coming together okay it's called as a sigma bond for example if a s and an s like this it comes like this it's a sigma bond if it is a p like this and a p like this okay plus and plus this is what this is also a sigma bond okay but if it is like this and like this then this is your pi bond okay this is your pi bond when a lateral sideway or a parallel overlap happens it's called as a pi bond i am going to erase all of this because it looks it looks very dirty but i hope you get it right yes so in a covalent bond whenever there are two bonds there is a sigma bond and there is a pi bond a sigma bond is because of head on collision and because of lateral you call it to be a pi bond okay let's read about the sigma bond and the pi bond a little more okay so sigma bond it is formed by end to end overlap head on collision of bonding orbitals along the internuclear axis for example let me show you this along the axis this is a head on collision so this is going to be a sigma bond okay this is going to be a sigma bond it is also called as axial overlap because it's happening on the axis or it is just called as head overlap okay or it's just called as head overlap got it now we come to pi bond this type of covalent bond is formed by the sidewise or lateral overlapping see how these are they are perpendicular to the internuclear axis that means my axis is this i have still taken let's say i have are what happened hmm i have still taken the z axis this is my z axis but i have taken a px and a px and these two when they are overlapping what is happening is my electron will be my electron will be here right right here will be my electron so can i just draw it like this this is where i am going to find my electron cloud right overlapping is happening so these are the places where i'll find my electron so that means i can just draw it like two plates yes i can just draw, draw it like two plates so it looks like if this is my axis these are the two places these are the two spaces where i can find the charged clouds and that is your pi bond okay that is your pi bond are you getting my point now in exam you get something called as number of p pi p pi bonds and number of p pi d pi bonds okay so when there is a p pi p pi bond and when there is a p pi d pi bond that you might have to find out okay that comes in the exam especially in your j mains and j advance it does come so understand this how will you find out number one point is if there is a double bond between the second period element second period element you know what are the second period element second period element is your uh, lithium then uh, beryllium boron carbon nitrogen oxygen fluorine these are all second period first period is hydrogen and helium okay hydrogen and helium don't even have the p orbital they only have s orbital but these second period they have only p orbitals right they don't have d so it is going to be p pi p pi whenever they are involved in bond making close your eyes and write down p pi p pi if it is nitrogen oxygen boron oxygen carbon nitrogen carbon oxygen always p pi p pi they don't even have d orbitals yeah how will they participate to d pi right it will always be p pi p pi but if there is a third period element present after oxygen what do you have sulfur after carbon you have silicon after nitrogen you have phosphorus right yes so what do you do whenever these elements are present it can either be p pi d pi or it can be p pi p pi okay h3po3 works let's take the example of 
H three P O three. Okay, H three P O three. If we take that means that P is my central atom. It will be O H here, O H here, O H here, and then double bond O P O three. P O three. अच्छा अच्छा. Sorry 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 sorry. One mistake. One mistake. It will be like this. Here will be H and here it will be O. Okay. Now, what is the valency of phosphorus? Phosphorus has five electrons in the last shell. No doubt about it. Last shell, five electrons. But it cannot be five electrons. No. Eight minus five, three electrons. So three bonds we will consider it to be covalent, covalent, covalent. Okay. Let's consider these three bonds to be covalent. Here, this is our covalent bond. This is our covalent bond, and this also is a covalent bond. Okay, but now what am I going to do? I'm going to change that to be coordinate bond. See, this one I'm going to change it into a coordinate bond. Take a look at it. Yes. So now number of p pi d pi is equal to One understood, understood. Yes. Okay. So basically, what you have to do is, what is the valency? This is the trick, my dear student. Remember it. Trick. Valency. What is the valency? If two, then leave two bonds as it is. Rest you convert it into coordinate bond. If it is three valency, keep them as covalent bond. Whatever is remaining, convert it into coordinate bond. So that's the way. You can find it out. Now you can take a homework and do it on yourself. Take the example of SO three and do it as a homework. Okay, SO three. Do it for SO three and find out how many p pi p pi bonds are there and how many p pi d pi bonds are there. All right. Yes, do it on your own. Now, what are the combination of orbitals? How can orbitals combine? Orbitals can combine as s s overlapping s. P overlapping, or it can be P P overlapping, or P P overlapping like this also, right? Yes. So let's check out the S S overlapping. See what is happening here. S plus S orbitals, right? Yes. How they are overlapping like this? No direction. And the easiest example is H H. They only have S orbitals, right? So obviously it is going to be S S S overlap. Now see for S and P orbital. S and P can Combine like this, or they can combine like this also. Okay, all right. S plus P, they can combine like this. And here is the example. Example is H F. H F has a S P overlap. Okay, it has a S P overlap. Now P P orbital can have C P and P orbital. They can combine like this. P P overlap. And the example is F F. Okay, it can be F F or C L C L. chlorine chlorine can also be like this f and f can also be like this all right so this ends our vbt now we go to molecular orbital theory which was given by hund and mulliken you remember that hund's rule yes yes hund's rule and then there was a mulliken scale and all pauling scale and all of that so that mulliken exactly so it was given by hund and mulliken what is mot mot is molecular orbital theory so they said that If there are two atomic orbitals, if they came nearer, 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 and they, if they overlap with each other, there will be two molecular orbitals. There won't be one molecular orbital. There will be two molecular orbitals. Two atomic orbitals are coming in. Two atomic orbitals are coming in. They will give rise to two molecular orbitals. Getting my point? Two atomic orbitals are coming. They are giving rise to two molecular orbital, two atoms, two molecules. Okay, all right. Now, what is the molecule that you are getting? The combination of two atomic orbital will give you two molecular orbital. It will be basically one of them will be anti-bonding molecular orbital and one of them will be bonding molecular orbital. Now, the anti-bonding molecular orbital has higher energy than the bonding molecular orbital. so just like how atomic orbitals just like how you fill the atomic orbital right the filling of electrons in molecular orbital it is it is exactly the same as you know obo principle hund's rule and pauli's exclusion right how you 
fill the lower energy first then you go to the higher energy you always have to have you know two electrons and then only you can do the pairing up right exactly the same those things are followed here also okay just like the structure of atom but like i said that energy of the bonding molecular orbital is lesser than energy of anti bonding molecular orbital great okay now see combination of and combination of atomic orbital it has to be of comparable energy you can't mix 1s and 2s and 1s and 2p together no it has to be 1s 1s it cannot be 1s and 2s this is wrong 1s 1s will only combine and they form a 1s bonding molecular orbital and 1s anti bonding molecular orbital getting my point yes i'll show you i'll show you don't worry so combining the atomic orbital it has to overlap in a large extent greater the overlap more stable will be the molecule formed okay if the overlapping is less it's not going to happen now combining the atomic orbital it must have the same symmetry you can't keep one like this and one like this no that doesn't happen okay if it is z then both of them has to be pz and pz it cannot be px and py pz and px no no it has to be same same okay then combination by addition they are saying constructive interval acha have you seen that let's say that one of the c waves are coming right one of the c waves are coming then there is another one also coming both of them you know they have combined now you see a big wave coming right a big wave is coming now imagine that one of the wave is coming and this other wave is going now what happened now these two they they combined and it has reduced the size of the wave right so that is this is your constructive interference i think you have studied this in physics also and this is called as destructive interference right i think you either you have studied or you are going to study so when the two electron waves are in phase that is positive and positive right they will give rise to the same sign but it is going to be of a bigger wave function that we are going to call it as psi b okay let's call that to be psi b because this is our linear combination of atomic orbitals we are going to do lcao okay so psi b is basically if this is your psi a and this is your psi capital b we are going to call it psi b addition of wave function has happened very simple very easy right yes very simple very easy it shows a higher amplitude than those two okay higher amplitude than those two so wave function for bonding molecular orbital is psi a plus psi b okay psi b is the wave function of atom b and this psi a is the wave function of atom a okay now combination of by subtraction destructive interference remember what i told you one of the c waves is coming and the other one is going so what will happen this one wants to come here this one is pushing it away so what happens the wave becomes smaller okay the wave becomes smaller now imagine if it is out of phase one is positive one is negative so together what will happen is they will reduce the amplitude further the wave will be reduced the size of the wave the amplitude of the wave the maximum distance of the wave will be reduced here it shows much less amplitude so here let's call this to be psi a okay Sm psi small letter a that means it will be psi a minus psi b okay this is out of the phase okay out of the phase so now what we are saying is now what we are saying is if it is sigma if it is just sigma no star just sigma is addition if it is sigma star that means it is subtraction this means if it is sigma that this means that it is constructive interference okay and this means that it is destructive interference this is your destructive interference this constructive one is your bmo that is bonding molecular orbital the destructive one is abmo that is anti bonding molecular orbital all right what are we studying we are still studying linear combination of atomic orbital so this is what molecular orbital is telling us and this is one of the best okay this is one of the best now how are you going to draw your atoms check it out how are you going to draw this okay imagine that we have n2 n2 nitrogen 2 right two nitrogen atoms are here so that means that this is my nitrogen 1 and this is my nitrogen 1 okay now what will happen is from this nitrogen let's consider this to be your 1s orbital so what will i do i will have one orbital here one here 
then I will do add 1 here, add 1 here. It has 14, right? N has 17, N has 17. Se sorry, sorry, sorry. 7 electrons in the outermost shell of one nitrogen, 7 electrons in the outermost shell of the other nitrogen. So, 7 plus 7, 14. Yes, I have only drawn 4 here. Only I have drawn 4, four here. I have 10 more to draw. Okay, that I will show you. That I will show you. But you get the point, right? You get the point? Yes. Okay. Now, moving on, what will happen is if there are two 1s atomic orbitals that are combining to form two molecular orbitals, then what will happen? The bonding molecular orbital sigma 1s and there will be anti-bonding sigma 1s. This will have a star. You will always put a star for the anti-bonding one. Okay. If it is 2s and 2p, if it is 2s and 2p, then see what happens. If it is 2s and 2p, for 2s, you will again write sigma 2s and see sigma star 2s. That is it. 2s is done. But if it is 2p, now you will have 3 orbitals. 3, 3 orbitals, my dear student. You will have sigma 2pz. Then you will have pi 2px and pi 2py. You will have sigma star 2pz and you will have the same pi, two, pi star 2px and pi star 2py. Are you getting my point? Z is where they combine coaxially. But x and y are collateral. Do you remember? Z was this axis. This was your x and this was your y, correct? So, exactly these two will be pi and z is sigma. Now, let's draw it everybody, okay? Now, let's draw it. So, if it is less than or equal to 14 electrons, let's take the example of nitrogen. Let's take the example of nitrogen N2. So, see, in your exam, you don't have to decorate it like this. In your exam, how you can do it is, it's less than 14, right? So, you write sigma 1s, sigma 1s, sigma star 1s, sigma 2s, sigma star 2s, okay. Then you have sigma 2pz, okay. Now what you are going to check it out, check it out, check it out, okay. Okay, now we are not going to draw sigma 2pz first. So, this is where you, you differ, okay. This is what you have to remember. Till here, it's the same everybody. Whatever I have written here, you are going to exactly copy it here also for more than. Let's say that this is oxygen. Oxygen has what? A 6 plus 6, right? Oxygen has 6 plus 6. That means what? Sorry, am I saying it right? Yeah, no, no. Huh, 8 plus 8, 16, right? So eight, 16 electrons here. So, let's consider this to be O2. Now, see what will happen here, okay? Same, 1s, sigma 1s, sigma star 1s, okay? Sigma 2s, you are again going to write sigma star 2s, okay? Now, what changes? Check it out. What changes is, here you are going to write 2, that is your pi, 2p x pi 2p y. Here you are going to write sigma star 2p z. Okay. Then you are going to write again 2 here that is your pi star 2p x and pi star 2p y. And then finally here you are going to write sigma 2p z. This is going to be star and this will be not star. This is how you are going to draw it. Now, in this case, what will change? In this case, it will be, check it out, you will draw here first. This will be your sigma 2pz. Then you are going to do like this. It will be pi 2px, pi 2py. Then again here, sigma star 2pz. Okay. And then it will be here again pi star 2px pi star 2py. So basically this part is same, this part changes. Here you have to remember 2, 1, 2, 1. Here you have to remember 1, 2, 1, 2. Actually no, I am so sorry. Wait, 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 wait. It has to be 1, 2, 2, 1. 1, 2 and then here, okay. It, you have to remember 1, 2, 
2, 1. Okay, this is what you have to remember. Now, N2, that means 14 electrons, right? 14 electrons. So, let's fill it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, okay? 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 electrons filled, okay? Now, see, here we have to fill oxygen, that is 16 electrons, right? So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 and 16. Done? Getting my point? Now, do you know that from here you can calculate bond order? From this, you can calculate bond order. How do you calculate bond order? Bond order is basically equal to, let's write it with a different color here so that you can remember it. Bond order is basically equal to number of bonding molecular orbital electrons, BMO electrons minus number of A, B, M, O electrons divided by 2. That's it. You want to find the bond order? Let's check it out. See here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Yes. So that means bond order for nitrogen. Bond order of nitrogen. Okay. Let's check it out. See. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 electrons in the bonding. And then here you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6? No, 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 no. Made a mistake. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10. 10 electrons in the bonding. 10 electrons in the bonding. And here see. 1, 2, 3, 4. 4. 10 minus 4 divided by 2 is equal to 3. Now nitrogen has 3 bonds, isn't it? Nitrogen has 3 bonds, isn't it? Check it out. See, you calculated it. Now see, how will you find out for oxygen? Okay, bond order for oxygen. Bond order of oxygen. See, figure it out. 1, 2, 3, 4. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 in bonding, okay? And then in, in the anti-bonding, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. 6 divided by 2, 4 by 2 is 2. Oxygen is bonded by 2 double bond. There, there is a double bond, right? There is a double bond, right? Easy peasy, biryani tasty. So if the bond order is 0, it means that the molecule does not exist. It means that the species does not exist. If the bond order, order is 1, 2 and 3, it means that it is single bond, double bond and triple bond respectively. Now, it also tells you about magnetic property, my dear student. Check it out. There are two unpaired electrons here, right? There are two unpaired electrons here and here. That means that O2 is what? O2 is paramagnetic. If there are one or more electrons in the molecular orbitals are unpaired, you call it paramagnetic. But check it out here, everything is paired. If it is paired, that means it is diamagnetic. N2 is diamagnetic, O2 is paramagnetic. Now, bond order is more, stability of molecule is more, but bond length is less. So, nitrogen has a lesser bond, or, bond length. Oxygen has a little more bond length, okay? All right, understanding everybody? Got it very clear? Absolutely. We are almost about to end the chapter, guys. We are almost about to end the chapter. I think another 8 to 9 slides and that's it. We are done. Now, the common features among the species Cn minus Co and No plus R. Any idea? Cn minus Co and No plus R. Any idea, guys? Think about it. Think about it. Carbon has how many electrons in it? What is the atomic number of carbon? You know it. You know it. Four. What is the nitrogen? Nitrogen is seven. So six plus seven. How many electrons are there? How many electrons are there? Figure it out. Figure it out. Come on. Quick, quick, quick. Six plus six is twelve. This is thirteen. But it says that it is minus. That means there are fourteen. That means there are fourteen. Yes. So, bond order is going to be 3. We just calculated for 14 electron, it is 3, right? Yes. Now, see, C and O. Carbon is 6, oxygen is 8. 6 plus 8, how much? 8 plus 6 is again what? 14. 14, that means bond order is 3 again. NO plus nitrogen is 7, oxygen is 8. How much is it going to be? 8 plus 7 is again 14, guys. Right? 8, no, 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 no. O plus. So, that means it is 
less so 7 plus 7 is 14 again bond order is 3 and these are isoelectronic makes sense or nonsense easy peasy biryani tasty see if these kind of exam if these kind of things can come in exam and they do and they do i will do use i will i will take care of some of the problems also and you will see that these kind of questions do come in the exam and it will be super easy and super simple for you okay all right all the three of them have 14 electrons they are isoelectronic and the bond order is 3 correct next which of the following is true tell me bond order is directly proportional to 1 by bond length directly proportional to bond energy is it is it bond order is inversely proportional to bond length yeah bond order increases bond length decreases bond length decreases and bond order increases more is the number of bond more is the energy option a totally makes sense <laughs> right we just did it we just did it everybody yeah this is the correct okay now of the species no no plus no2 plus and no minus the one with the minimum bond strength is one with the minimum bond strength okay let's do it n and o so nitrogen has seven electrons oxygen has eight electrons so eight plus uh, seven is 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 15 electrons right 15 okay so if it is more than 15 then how do we draw if it is more than 15 chalo let's just draw it no let's just draw it so you will have one s sigma one star one s sigma one s sigma star one s sigma 2s sigma star 2s right yes okay now what we're going to do is now what we're going to do is let's just draw it as uh, this okay this is no this is no right no is greater than 14 so that means that 1 2 2 1 so it will be sorry sigma 2pz it will be sigma 2pz here it will be pi 2px pi 2py yes then again 2 so pi star 2px pi star 2py and then finally 1 that is sigma this is sigma star 2pz okay all right so let's do it for n O, N, O, N has 7 electrons, oxygen has 8 electrons, right? So, 7 plus 8 is 15, yes? So, let's do it. 15 means 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 here, okay? 15 here. So, that means what is the bond order, guys? What is the bond order? Check it out. 1, 1, 2, 3, 4. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10 minus 5 divided by 2, that is uh, 2.5, this is 2.5, then we have NO plus, if it is NO plus that means 1 electron gone, if it is 1 electron gone that means 70, uh, it means 14, so for NO plus the bond order is, for 14 electrons how much is it? 14 electron bond order is 3, right? If it is NO2 plus, if it is NO2 plus, then how many will be there? Check it out, check it out. Let's let's do it here, okay? NO2 plus, right? That means these two electrons will go. These two electrons will go, correct? Yes, if these two electrons go, goes, then what will it be? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Correct? So, it will be 8 minus 1, 2, 3, 4. 8 minus 4 divided by 2 is equal to what? 2, yes, 2, correct. So, NO2 plus bond order is 2. And then NO minus, NO minus that means there is another one electron. So, we will add it here, NO minus another one electron. That means that uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Bond order is uh, 10 minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 10 minus 6 is uh, this divided by 2. So, this will be 2. NO minus. Correct only, no? Correct only, right? The correct answer they say is uh, minimum bond strength. 
minimum bond strength one second one two three four five six seven eight nine ten ten here okay one two three four five six ha huh. 10 minus 6 4 divided by 2 is equal to 2 okay all right so the correct answer they are saying is uh, have i made a mistake here for no plus is also 3 no plus is 3 no 2 plus is 2.5 have i made a mistake guys no 2 plus they are saying it's 2.5 no 2 plus NO2 plus, so two electrons will go, right? I don't think I've made a mistake, but they're saying that I've made a mistake, okay. Mm, NO plus is three, right? Two electrons are gone. That means that, uh, what will be two electrons? You know what, check it out once again. No? I think I'm, I might have made a mistake here in case, just in case of NO2+. Plus. Just in case of NO2+, plus, just, just calculate this once more. Or let's, let's do it once again. Hai na? 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, less than 14 electrons, right? Less than 14 electrons. So it will be this, this, 2, 1, 2, 1, right? So it will be this is star, this is star, these two, and then this is star and this is star, correct? NO2 plus. Now, NO has uh, 7 electrons. O2 plus, that means 6. So, 7 plus 6 is equal to um, 13 electrons, right? Yes, 13 electrons. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. So, that means that bond order is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 9 minus 1, 2, 3, 4. 9 minus 4 divided by 2 is equal to 5 by 2. This is also 2.5. Correct. Yes. So, I did make a mistake. The correct answer is NO minus. Now, I have sorted it out. And with this note, everybody, we are done with the session here. Yes, I hope that you have understood everything. We will be doing more questions about this. And uh, let's use our concepts. Yes. Stay tuned to this channel. I'll see you very soon with mole concept and stoichiometry for class 11. And I'll see you very soon with solid state for J mains and J advanced for uh, class 12. Okay. Tara bye. Don't go anywhere. We'll see you very soon and lots of love. Bye.